Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimruttshow.com. That's jimruttshow.com. Today's guest is Forrest Landry, the founder and CEO of Magic Flight, a company that was among the first to introduce the portable vaporizer to the world. It's great to be here, Jim. I'd love to talk to you. Glad to have you. It should be an interesting conversation. In addition to uh, his interests in business, Forrest has many other interests under the auspices of the Ronin Institute. He does research into things including the manner and degree by which products and system design influences culture and ecology. And he explores the nature of the interface between the organic and the inorganic, particularly as realized in the relationship between concept and computation. And he also researches the manner and models by which effective personal and social governance could potentially be achieved. And that's just on his research side. He's also a philosopher with some serious work in both ethics and metaphysics. Big stuff. But before we go there, why don't you tell us just a little bit about Magic Flight? Well, as you mentioned, uh, the organic and inorganic. So it's a woodworking company. And so we try to emphasize the use of uh, materials that are renewable experiences that are essentially very much first person, uh, not necessarily defined in terms of some interface or some compute boundary. And to really basically look at what are very, very clear and simple solutions to what would otherwise be difficult problems. So in effect, uh, you know, design has a lot of interesting challenges associated with it. So we try to essentially go beyond just the traditional methods of thinking about design and look at, um, you know, tried and true, but also to really bring that forward and to learn what is a complete system solution in the space of problem solving. So Magic Flight looks at that from a point of view of, you know, how can we do this with industrial design? How can we do this with various kinds of tooling? Uh, what is it like to talk about the experience of the employee and the, the experience of the customer in an integrated way? So we don't really believe that there are necessary trade-offs between those kinds of things. A lot of times we can find design solutions that allow us to get all that we want. And um, that's that's what we strive for. That's great. Beyond your business life, you're working on some of the biggest issues in the world. What is your motivation? How do you see the current state of the world? You know, What is it that's motivating you to do the work that you do? Well, in, in, in short, I, I have a great regard for the fact of being alive at all. So in effect, I, I consider to be able to breathe and to look at the stars and have an experience of awe to be you know, really a very fundamental gift. And so I, I think that in one sense, you know, I'm wanting to be in service to have, you know, essentially other life, other people be able to experience that gift as well. So we're thinking about our children and the future and such like that. Uh, so I guess you could say that in a fundamental way, I'm, I'm really uh, in service to nature. I'm in service to uh, the future of humanity and to thinking about those things in, in, a, in a very strong way. So, I, you know, I love, I love the wild. I love to preserve, you know, essentially really good, healthy experiences and to essentially preserve the capacity for us to, to thrive. I think that it's not necessarily the case that, you know, we have to have some sort of, uh, again, trade-off between human well-being and natural well-being. I think both can be achieved in, in a really good way. And that that's a lot of what I'm looking at as, you know, what motivates me? What is it, what is it that I'm really passionate about? How can we create thriving in the long term? not just in the short term, but for the next thousand years, how can we make it so that, you know, the world is, is a genuinely beautiful place and a genuinely healthy place to live in and that people really like being here. And what do you make of the, you know, the current status quo, the way the world is currently operating with respect to those goals? <laughs> well, I don't think I need to go very far to say it doesn't look very good right now. Uh, a lot of our choice making processes is, is, is not grounded in, in things that actually have a long term stance. Um, in fact, they're not even optimized very well for short term stance. And so, in effect, when I look at the choice making that is happening in the world today and the, and the ways in which we're building things, I see a lot of lost opportunities, a lot of lost you know, resources that, that are essentially squandered. We are currently in a situation where there's tremendous opportunity and we hardly even know it. Yeah, we're on a, an epoch, it seems to me, where the future is ours. It could be more glorious than anything most humans have ever imagined, or it could be the worst of disasters. And it's all up to us. Pretty much. And so in effect, there's a, uh, there is a real choice here. I mean, we can either go into a dystopia or we can make the world a healthier place to be in. So in effect, we kind of have to know how to make a choice like that. Like, what does it mean to uh, 
to to be conscious of the values from which we're choosing. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. But before we do, I actually dove a little bit into your work on philosophy. And I thought some of that might be useful to surface as a foundation. Let's start with your thinking about ethics. To the degree that I understood it, and I am by no means a philosopher, you seem to make a distinction between ethics, which was a uh, essentially a fundamental process for thinking about the world, and morality, which is, is more arbitrary and defined within a specific domain. Could you say a little bit more about those? So it's, it's a bit like the difference between principles and rules. So a principle effectively is, is a general uh, sort of heuristic that we say, okay, well, if we're in a world where these kinds of things are the case, then it's probably going to be important for us to think about these kinds of issues. And so in effect, when we're looking at rules, we're looking at uh, things which are very, very specific to a particular situation. So say you're on a email form or something like that, a rule might be don't type everything in capital letters because you can't distinguish between common words like Polish and Polish. So in effect, there's these sort of background ideas that are very, very general that get translated into specific ideas that are relevant within a particular context of communication. And when I say communication, I'm thinking of all forms of communication, you know, physical action, building things, uh, driving down the street, you know, all of those kinds of interactions can be thought of as a communication between uh, self and world in a, in a general way. So if I'm going to, you know, talk about choices, you know, first of all, I have to say, what is the, the basis of the choice? Am I just basically following a rule that is specific to a particular world? Or have I checked to make sure that that rule actually makes sense within a greater context of values? Could give us an example. Well, as I mentioned, um, you know, on the internet forum, there's certain things which which make a lot of sense as far as good behavior and what, what actually constitutes communication that, that fulfills the function of communication, i.e. we make sense of our lives, we understand choices that we're making a little better, and so on. When we're talking about ethics, what we're basically saying is, okay, well, what are the general principles of communication that apply in every forum? So, for example, if I have a medium of communication where if I just say the word hang up, that it hangs up the phone, then all of a sudden I now have a limit as to what I can actually say in the communication channel because things that are content are now going to affect the context. So, in effect, we, we, we identify that there's this sort of principle that if I have a relationship between content and context such that uh, there's a conditionalization on the context based upon the content, uh, then in effect, I limit the capacity of the communication channel to carry information. So in effect, there are certain things that happen in the world that basically limit communication, and we find that those are uh, less than desirable. So we translate that into a, uh, a specific situation. So for instance, if I um, you know, am in a conversation with somebody and I pull out a gun and I shoot them, that ends the conversation. I mean, there's there's a very fundamental change of state there. And so in a sense of recognizing that you know, there are these general principles about communication itself. What does it mean to have reciprocity? What does it mean to have symmetry? You know, information theoretic kinds of ways of thinking about it, which are very, very abstract, um, translated into concrete realities of thou shall not kill as a commandment, you know, that there's a relationship between these two things. And a lot of times as the world changes, we have to rethink the relationship between the principles and the rules. So as everybody knows, the world has gotten much different than it was, say, 200 years ago. Uh, the introduction of technology and the internet and uh, cars and automobiles, planes and all that, all, all of this stuff has, has really drastically changed the world in which we live. And so in effect, what we're trying to do now is to say, okay, how do we understand what are the choices that we need to make? What are the principles that we need to apply to, in effect, even understand what good set of codes would be in a particular domain of action? So in effect, it's kind of like the conversations that, that are the basis of policymaking or the conversations that are the basis of judicial process or things like that. You know, in effect, we're, we're just trying at this point to understand how do we understand the situation well enough so that the choices about how to implement things at the level of policy, at the level of rules actually make sense uh, relative to what our underlying values are. And yeah, that does seem to be the challenge of the time. And can we find a firm basis on which to craft a set of operating rules, which I think you call morality, for our time? Yes, that's correct. So in, a, in effect, you, you asked about why is the philosophy important? Well, if we, if we treat the topic of ethics as being uh, the principles of effective choice, right? So, so now we can say, well, immediately – you know, what are those principles? But we also have to have some notion of what do we mean by effective and what do we mean by choice? Uh, one of the great dilemmas of the time, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, metaphysics is, is actually kind of important, is that we really need coherent thinking about the nature of the relationship 
between choice and causation. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of really good thinking about causation. We have science and technology, which effectively disciplines of how to think about causation in a really good way. We've, we've learned about reason. We've, in effect, developed clear thinking tools in that space. But we don't have similarly good tools about thinking about what is what do we mean by choice? In fact, if we take uh, science and technology as at, at face value, they would assert something along the lines of maybe there isn't choice. Maybe the world is deterministic. Maybe there's some sense in which the notion of choice is an illusion. And without really addressing, you know, what is the fundamental basis of choice? How do we understand that concept? Then the, the concept of ethics itself doesn't end up having uh, you know, a foundation. So one of the things that the metaphysics does is it gives us a clear way of thinking about the notion of choice and therefore a clear way of notion of, of thinking about the notion of effective choice as a subclass of choice. And then we can start thinking about what are the principles of effective choice. And all of this is pretty important because if we don't have a clear sense as to what those principles are, then there really isn't any clear thinking about the nature of what an effective choice actually is in any particular context. So, you know, in effect, we can we can start with these really abstract things, but ultimately it ends up being about pretty practical issues. Yeah, let's get back to choice soon, but let me take a little dive into metaphysics. You know, as people who listen to the show know, I'm known to say from time to time, when I hear the word metaphysics, I reach for my pistol. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, historically, one of those people go, metaphysics, what a bunch of baloney. Just give me epistemology. That's all I need. However, I did read some of your material on your metaphysics, and it was at least intelligible. Let me run back what I thought I heard, and you can tell me whether I was hearing it right or not, and then I, I can give you my critique on what you had to say. You know, my take was that you were trying to bridge the gap between realism and idealism. Uh, however, my take was that the realism that you put forth was essentially a straw man version that really isn't relevant to what realists think today and that it seemed to be only about the hardcore physical matter when you know practicing realists now take into consideration the dynamics of all sorts i mean we know things like systems theory network theory complexity science higher levels of cognitive neuroscience etc they're all about change over time it's a distinction I've called the distinction between the dancer, which is the matter, and the dance, the dynamics. And if we consider all those to be part of realism, do we actually need metaphysics? And if we do, tell me why. Well, actually, I, I, I actually agree with everything that you've been saying. So first of all, let's, let's be clear about what we mean by metaphysics, because I, I think the, the, the observation you're making about hey, you know, uh, when we're talking about metaphysics, what are we actually talking about? The, the, the whole New Age movement uh, has, has, has largely made it a, you know, a topic that's, that's not intellectually coherent. So, you know, the first thing to say is, is what are we talking about? Well, metaphysics is, is the questions of what is and how do we know? Uh, it's more or less an academic discipline the way I'm thinking about it. So I have great uh, appreciation for the sentiment. So in effect, it's, it's not so much from my perspective about bridging the, the relationship between realism and idealism so much as actually creating a foundation for both of those concepts. So instead of saying one or the other of those ways is, is, is true, uh, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to say, how do we support these concepts from an even deeper basis so that this doesn't end up being a contest? The other thing is, is that I actually agree with the notion that it's not just about matter. It's also about the interactions and the dynamics and that their progression through time. And in addition to that, I would add, actually, there's even a third category. So there's the, the sort of stuff in space perspective. Then there's the forces in time perspective. And then there is the probabilities and possibilities. So in effect, what we're essentially saying is, is that it's not just even about the dynamics, but it's also about the sequences of possible histories. Uh, when we look at quantum mechanics, for example, we look at things which have to do with alternate uh, situations like if, if this particular measurement happens and, the, and and this state is determined, then these other states become uh, the possible futures. And so in effect, there's a many worlds interpretation, and we kind of see ourselves as basically being in one context or in another, as dependent upon measurement process. So in effect, we can think of measurement process as not just being a distinct thing, but also a kind of dynamic that is the interrelationship between observable objective states and virtualize potential states as, as mediated by, say, um, you know, one of the wave equations. So I think that, you know, the notion of dynamic or the notion of realism is actually a, a very strong and very coherent point of view, and it's actually bracketed by these two other uh, frames of reference, the uh, actuality and the potentiality. I think that when, when people uh, look at 
uh, realism and idealism in the in the older way, you're right. They tend to think about it as either being deterministic, um, in the sense of you know defined by external phenomena, defined by matter, versus in some sort of subjective sense, as in you know who's the observer, uh, who's making the measurement, what moment in time is the is the selection of which possible world we're going to end up in. So in effect, it's not so much that the ways in which I'm thinking of these are are a straw man or, or caricature so much as they're trying to look at kind of what, are the, what is the fundamental idealized state by which to understand these concepts. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I continue to remain a realist, though with the distinctions that I made that, you know, there, I do believe there is a real world out there. There's only one of them, probably not a multiverse, at least not in the quantum mechanical many worlds theory. In fact, I put my flag down on the as if many worlds interpretation, which is do the math as if many worlds, but by some process we don't understand, only one of them becomes real. I think we actually agree on all of this. I mean, I, we, the, the way you're describing realism to me sounds very coherent. I think the only adjustment that I would be making is instead of attaching the notion of real directly to the objective, which is what uh, realism would, would normally do. I mean, idealism in a comp- complementary way would say that the notion of real is attached to the subjective. That in this particular orientation, we're saying that real is attached to the relationship between the objective and the subjective. So in other words, the interaction is real. And anything we project as being what that interaction tells us about the objective world or what that interaction tells us about the subjective, uh, those are things which are epiphenomena of the notion of real, which lives at the interaction level. Yeah, though I would also, I think it's also, uh, and this is yet to be fully determined, but at least my sense, most likely, that we're going to discover that the subjective is less spooky than it seems. And once we fully understand how consciousness works, for instance, we're going to be surprised that we ever got ourselves so tangled up in knots. You know, that the subjective is a biological process like any other. Biology, of course, is compounded of first chemistry and below that physics. And it it just is what it is. And it's an emergent phenomenon from the way matter and the dynamics of matter are ordered, and particularly in in animals, as essentially uh, an emergent dynamic process at the intersection between perception on one side, memory on the other. And memory can be both genetic memory and lifetime memory and some form of process in between. And it's probably no more than that. So in which case, the whole idea of a hard problem just goes away. It just is what it is. Well, there's a lot of subtle things associated with that. We're going to get kind of far afield from thinking about choice and, you know, how to do governance and things like that if we go down this particular road. I mean, I I'm personally am not a favor of the uh, many worlds theory myself. I tend to be more on the Copenhagen interpretation side. But when we get to the uh, the whole notion of, you know, can we derive a first person perspective from a third person mechanical world? Um, or can we think about uh, choice purely in terms of causation? Can we can we actually model consciousness in terms of compute? You know, based upon, you know, again, a lot of thinking about this kind of thing, I actually think that the notion of compute and consciousness are distinct and that in effect, we don't really have a coherent notion of consciousness because we're trying to think about it in terms of compute. But that's a you know, that's that's a whole you know can of worms and we could spend, you know, obviously days talking about this sort of thing. I guess the thing is, is that if we're if we're looking at, you know, what are the principles of ethics and how do ethics translate into, um, you know, choices about the world and so on and so forth, we can either, you know, try to reconcile the relationship between choice and causation at a fundamental level. Or we can do pretty much what uh, what Western legal systems have done, which is assume that there is consciousness, assume there is choice, assume there is a subjective, and that the subjective has some sort of notion of choice, and then try to figure out what jurisprudence looks like after that. So, so you know, again, it depends upon what conversation you want to have. Yeah, you know, I do like to dive into these foundations a little bit, and then we'll pop up to a more applied level. But again, when I hear conversations about things like free will or determinism versus random strikes me that that all misses the point that what we have is a specific mechanism let's call it a human body with a brain in it a series of resonances between the neurons and the body and the stomach and the perceptions from the senses etc and stuff comes in and then affordances are triggered and that's it I think, you know, to say what is, is there free will just seems to me a question that has no meaning. We know that we do trigger affordances, i.e. we do things in response to our genetic and lifetime memories and in response to our perceptions. 
But is there anything actually useful in trying to call that free will? Well, I, I don't tend to use the notion free will. I mean, the notion of free and the notion of will both have uh, certain complications associated with them. I mean, I use the word choice fairly specifically, i.e. there's a range of potentials or some sort of selection, and then there's a consequence. In the way I think about things, there's no such thing as absolutely free without having some, uh, at least maybe multiple limitations. And there's no notion of uh, limitation that doesn't have some degree of freedom associated with it. Uh, and these are you know, implied in the, in the structure of the relationships. So in a, in a sense, when we're getting into, you know, can we model the whole thing just in terms of molecular biology, or can we model the whole thing in terms of some sort of determinism? I've looked at those questions pretty closely. And I, and I think that really the answer is just no, you know, in effect, when we, when we look at like uh, reductionism as a, as a fundamental principle, you know, to basically say that everything that is knowable about chemistry uh, could, in principle, be defined purely in terms of uh, our understanding of quantum mechanics um, or, you know, take the general uh, standard model and, and and try to see if that in combination with quantum mechanics can be used as a basis to derive everything that is knowable about chemistry. Well, as, as, as some people have observed who have deep knowledge of both topics, it, it turns out there's phenomena in chemistry that just in principle can't be explained on the basis of the standard model. So in effect, there's a there's some kinds of emergent phenomena that we just don't have the capacity to essentially derive uh, in any kind of first principled way, based upon the the, the notions of causation on the quote uh, prior domain of physics, and this is actually very surprising. So because the the thing is is that if we look at the notion of reductionism as a philosophy as a principle, and we take you know what is the place what is the the exemplar of uh, the strongest likely relationship where we would be able to see a relationship between uh, physics and chemistry as being the quintessential exemplar of a hard science reductionist perspective, uh, it turns out that not even in that case does it work. So therefore, the notion of reductionism itself has to be called into question. Yeah, and that's very true. And of course, that's one of the core foundations of complexity science is that, in fact, the absolute definition of emergence is that it cannot be predicted from lower level states. And actually, and we can get out of having to worry about deterministic worlds even easier than that from a practical perspective. Even if we retreat to physics, some surprisingly simple physical models fall prey to deterministic chaos, where even the most tiny differences in initial conditions produce widely different trajectories of even a very simple physical system. So therefore, from any practical perspective, even if you had a whole universe made out of computronium, you still couldn't calculate the trajectories of some surprisingly simple physical systems. So the, you know, the worry about determinism from either a practical or theoretical perspective seems to me not worth pursuing. I think we're agreed on this. Um, the interesting thing about uh, what you just described, I call it uh, microstate amplification, that uh, things that are in the you know, the extreme right side of the decimal point end up becoming uh, macroscopically important. And so in effect, you know, we can look at, well, what is knowable about the microstate of the domain? Well, ultimately, there's an information boundary there. There's a, there's a place that we can see that there are actual limits as to uh, what it's possible to know at all, uh, even in principle. And in effect, when, we, when we, we go into these things and we say, okay, well, there is a notion of other than what is knowable, there's essentially a fundamentally not just the known and the unknown, but there is actually the unknowable. Uh, so then when we go thinking about the nature of choice and so on, you know, there's, there's, there's now a basis for us to say, okay, well, there's, there's more than just the feedback of the, of the you know, physical system that we're looking at. There's also this something else. And you know, we could, again, skip over a whole lot of intermediate levels, but at a certain point, we can say something like, uh, utilitarian ethics that's based purely upon feedback mechanisms and, uh, you know, objective metric and criteria and stuff like that, uh, optimization problems, uh, to some extent isn't the whole story that there needs to be some notion of a value ethics, a kind of uh, way of thinking about, um, you know, what do we really care about? What really matters here? What is, what is the kind of things that are uh, fundamentally uh, our basis of choice that doesn't come from some sort of feedback mechanism?
Yep. Let's uh, let's go there. But before we do it, I want to do one last digression into foundations. And this was something I did not know you were interested in until I started doing my research a couple days ago. And I was very interested by the little tiny one page paper you wrote called the epistemic sandwich, (laughs) because this is an area I'm very interested in is time. And I am generally aligned with the group of people like uh, Unger and Smolin who believe time is real and that indeed time may be more real than space. And you made a pretty interesting argument. I wouldn't say it was, it was a lead pipe cinch, but it seemed a good way to get to a non-entropic arrow of time, at least the, uh, uh, the range of space in which we live. So I thought that was quite interesting. Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you had an interest in that. I, I, I tend to find myself in a fairly interesting position. So um, on one hand, I can definitely count myself in the camp of saying that time is, in a certain sense, uh, more fundamental than space and more fundamental than possibility. Um, so in effect, there's a uh, there's this bisymmetric relationship that that effectively comes out of that. But that that's only one way to think about it. It turns out that there is this thing called the incommensuration theorem, which basically says there's a completely complementary perspective of how to think about it, which is the perspective that uh, modern physics uh, largely seems to be taking, which is that we have this third person orientation to sort of what you've been uh, treating as a kind of classical realist perspective as a you know, time is an illusion that effectively we can talk about the complete world state of the universe. And so in effect, there's this really deep interrelationship between the symmetry and the discontinuity that we see in the foundations of quantum mechanics and general relativity and the sort of physicalist, uh, realist perspective. And this, you know, as a, as a third person perspective, ultimately, and then there's this first person perspective, which treats uh, the asymmetry of time is fundamental and the notion of the continuity of consciousness is fundamental. And then in effect, we can be in one way of thinking about it or in the other way of thinking about it. And that, that those two in effect are mutually, mutually orthogonal ways of, of, of conceptualizing the universe. And so in effect, the, the, the whole reason that metaphysics is of interest is because it's the basis by which we can derive this principle of, of this orthogonality between those two perspectives. It, in a sense, becomes the uh, ordinating basis by which the concepts themselves are, are, are really understood. And that makes it actually pretty profoundly important. You have to dig a little further in that, because I would say I, you know, I tend to align myself more with the arrow of time is real, more in the Lee Smallin model. And by the way, folks, there is an episode of, on the show from Lee Smallin where we go into these in some considerable detail. I'll have to go back and relook and see at your argument on the orthogonality and that there are essentially dual ways of looking at the world, which would be quite interesting. I think we've probably spent as much time on these kinds of foundational questions as it makes sense to do. Let's switch to value ethics. It's certainly highly important when we think about operating in the real world. Okay. What do you want to know? <laughs> uh, tell me what your theory is of value ethics. <laughs> well, there's there's a couple of uh, specific things. So first of all, is that when we when we think about values, it's it's important to contextualize that there's there's a lot of other concepts that people sort of tie in with this. And again, coming from a uh, a sort of abstract perspective, I tend to think in terms of meaningfulness and purposefulness. So in other words, the notions of meaning, values, and purposes. Um, have this distinctness that those three concepts are distinct. They're not interchangeable. Obviously, they don't mean the same thing. And and by one, we don't we don't really want to substitute the other. And a lot of a lot of people do this, you know, kind of accidentally. They they're thinking about values in the way that they would think about purposes. And, and unfortunately, uh, that that ends up creating a lot of confusion because the way in which meaning works, the way in which values work, and the way in which purposes work are actually uh, very different. They are they are truly uh, kind of um, different modalities of, of how to think about relationships in life and so on. Why don't we start with that? I mean, I will say that there's been a lot of talk lately about meaningfulness, and a lot of it's left me scratching my head. So I would love it if you could go through those three and provide your take on what they are and how they're distinct from each other. Great. So let's take a very object example. So I have a toaster, okay? And, and as far as I'm concerned, the purpose of the toaster is to cook toast. I put put some bread in and I push the button and a few minutes later I get some some breakfast. So as far as the relationship between myself and the toaster is concerned, if we if we consider the toaster, in, in, the purpose of the toaster is defined by something external to the toaster. In other words, I am not the toaster. The toaster has a purpose assigned to it by something other than the object of the toaster. 
when we talk about values, we're actually talking about something which is, you know, completely different. Like, so if I, you know, have children and, and, and then I think about, you know, maybe I'm a farmer in some medieval uh, context and I might say, you know, my son is to replace me and is to essentially assist with the farm and so on and so forth. Well, that but the son might have his own desires as to what he wants to do with life. And the, and the value of the son isn't necessarily going to be defined just in terms of the functions that he's going to perform for the family. He may decide that he has uh, wants to go to school or, 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 or does something else. And of course, these are somewhat modern interpretations. But the, the idea here is, is that when we think about the value of something, we're thinking about it as being innate. In other words, not something imposed from the outside as from the father to the son, but something that occurs from the inside, i.e. In- internal to the son itself. And, you know, the, the person, you know, when we, when we talk about values, we talk about them as coming from inside of ourselves and manifesting in the choices that we make in, in, into the world. So there's a kind of origin of expression versus target of expression kind of uh, aspect of thinking about it. Um, so in effect, if we, if we want to look at what the notion of meaningfulness is, uh, meaningfulness in the sense of, you know, whether or not the word dog means a furry creature that has legs and barks, the, the sound in the air, dog, and the particular associations that we subjectively make internal and the object reference that it has to a furry creature that happens to be in the room sitting next to me, you know, those associations are not held purely in an external way, nor purely in an internal way. They happen to occur in the relationship between the subjective and the objective. They are inherently transpersonal. So in effect, if we were to sort of sum up, we would say that purposes are defined uh, in such a way as that they come from the outside. Uh, values are defined in such a way that they come from the inside. And that meaning is essentially something that is between and in the relationship between the inside and the outside. Okay. Now, of course, sociologists would tell us, that at least from a human perspective, our values don't really come from inside us. They are actually very strongly creatures of our community, our family, our teachers, our religions, etc. Well, I would think that this is this is actually a classical case of you know the, the sociology doesn't isn't really as interested in trying to come up with definitions of these things that would be metaphysically coherent in the way that I'm using it. So in effect, it's it's sort of like we actually want both. We want to have the clarity of the terminology and the real results of the of the anthropology, sociology, uh, psychology really integrated well. And I think that to some extent, the things that uh, the sociologists are pointing to has has much to do with meaningfulness, um, you know, the meaningfulness of, of relationships in the community, the communications that are occurring and so on and so forth, uh, as much as they're referring about values. So obviously, when we talk about values, purpose and meaning, these things, although they may be distinct concepts, they are not inseparable that uh, wherever any one of these concepts occurs, the other two will for sure occur, uh, whether we're conscious of that or not. And so. Uh, a lot of times, because of the necessity of this co-occurrence, uh, people tend to uh, elide the differences between them, and, and, th- and that may or may not be important depending upon what we're trying to do. If we're thinking about ethics and we're really trying to have a kind of rigorous way of thinking about this to really be clear when we're making choices that are, are profoundly impactful, if we're thinking about existential risk or if we're thinking about uh, civilization um, you know, possibility of collapse and, and you know, economic forces that are of, of, of huge magnitude, um, you know, whether to set policies that may go to war or whatnot. There's a there's a real importance that we think about the ethics from a principal point of view with with deep, deep, deep clarity. Um, in, in effect, there's there's some real necessities around this. So, for instance, if we, uh, you know, look at the relationship between man, machine and nature and, and we realize that, you know, in the technology that we've developed, that we have. Uh, created capacities to create and destroy the whole world, uh, you know, nuclear war or biotech or, or, you know, things of that nature, that in effect, we, we, we now find ourselves in a position of really needing to make very, very good principal choices. And so as a result, uh, the clarity and the quality of the ethics that we're using has to be of just absolutely paramount quality. I mean, like, you know, if we have the power of gods, we effectively need to have the kind of ethical coherency that a god would have. You know, not to really take this into religion, but just to really give an indication of just how important it is to be profoundly clear about some of these concepts. That's perfect. Why don't we try then to integrate a specific example that gets to or applies ethics in the context of meaningfulness, values, and purpose? That's 
pick a, a real example. Say I'm making a decision on whether to do some experiment with CRISPR, for instance. Well, there's a there's there's a lot of different directions we can go with this. So um, you might be familiar with the work of Dave Snowden, who talked about the difference between complicated, i.e., the kinds of things that we can do with computation and simulation and so on, and complex, which is situations that are more like nature, where uh, there's lots and lots of factors interacting, and we don't actually know the complete state of the system at any given moment. So, you know, in one sense, we can say, okay, how do we make choices in the space of the complex, given that the only thing that we really can control is stuff that's happening in the domain of the complicated? Um, and it turns out that the relationship between these uh, two realms of operation is, is, is actually it's, it's pretty important to really understand that because there's some things that, for example, we can't predict with any amount of accuracy. So when we're making choices in this particular space, we're, we're finding that we really need to account for uh, whether or not we can do a safe to fail probe, i.e. can we interact with the complicated world, gather some information about it, um, use that information in some way to at least do a proxy of some sort of you know, vague simulation so we have at least some indication as to uh, what the outcomes might be. But, but in that situation, we're still having to have some notion of value. What outcomes do we consider to be successful? Uh, what are we actually looking to have happen? And is that, you know, the desires of what we are wanting to have happen, on what basis are, are those things clarified? So, for example, if we're, if we're looking at, okay, can we do a safe-to-fail probe in the sense of CRISPR? Well, already it may be the case that we can't. Like, for instance, we don't necessarily want to experiment you know, on biological systems, because if the uh, thing has this replicating uh, capacity, then it might be that once we've done the experiment, we'll never actually ever get to do another experiment again, because we destroyed the system in which we were performing the experiment. Um, so in that case, we see already can't do safe to fail probes if, if, if the probe itself is 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 too consequential. Um, so obviously, you don't test, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, global nuclear war is effectively going to create, uh, you know, nuclear winter, because that would obviously be bad. You you don't get to do that experiment more than one time. So in effect, there's a uh, there's a notion here of, first of all, what do we care about? Well, just getting the data from the uh, from the safe to fail probe is is really only a proxy for our capacity to predict the future and the capacity to predict the future is itself relative to some sort of value statement. So, you know, the, the purposes of our safe to fail probes are effectively connected to the meaningfulness of our values. So there's another level here, which is, you know, also kind of kind of really important is that when we think about, um, you know, can we actually do um, experiments of this particular kind? Somewhere along the way, we, we, we realize that we really just can't always know what the impacts are going to be, uh, even in principle. And that therefore we have to think about, can we get clear as to whether we're doing the right simulation at all? Um, are we even asking the right questions? Um, so, for instance, if I do a whole bunch of simulations about factor X, but it turns out that the thing that I'm really looking for is a solution to problem Y, then to some extent, you know, I've, I'm, I'm investing lots and lots of energy into the wrong problem. So, so in a lot of ways, what we're really trying to do here is, is essentially to ask better questions. Can we get to the place where we're even, uh, you know, looking at CRISPR and, and, and things like that? You know, when we're thinking about it from an ethical point of view, it's like, you know, do we actually know what the criteria of success is? Do we do we have a real sense as to uh, what is the whole systems approach that's actually going to be satisfying to a whole range of criteria rather than just the one or two that we happen to be conscious of at this moment? So it's it's those kinds of things which would be you know directions in which we would go with something like this. And there's there are others, but those are the ones that occur to me just off the top of my head. Yeah, when I was talking with Dave Snowden here on the show, one of the things I pointed out to him, and he agreed, is that one of the things you have to keep in mind is that every complicated system is inevitably embedded in at least one complex system, and that there is a flow between the two. Take, for instance, a business. A business is basically a complicated system, and yet it interacts with a complex system called the marketplace, right? <laughs> Yeah. And a farm is a relatively complicated system, though it has some complexity to it, but it's mostly complicated. And a, but yet a farm is embedded in an ecosystem, which is a classic complex system. And so trying to understand the, the couplings between the complicated and the complex has to always be done in the context that every complicated system is embedded in at least one complex system. Yeah, I, I completely agree. The, the, the main thing is to, to understand that between the uh, complex and the complicated, that the complex is stronger 
is is actually uh, in a certain sense the foundational basis. And so, in a, you know, when we when we think about the relationship between uh, purposes and values, for example, that in effect the values have to be stronger than the purposes. That the values uh, provide the basis for our choice making as to what we're actually going to attempt to do in the world, and that those values aren't coming from some sort of feedback mechanism. They're coming from some sort of deeper basis, some sort of, uh, you know, I hesitate to use the word, but some sort of transcendent perspective. And again, I'm not necessarily advocating a particular interpretation of the of the notion of transcendent in this particular case, but I am saying that if you take the values and you treat them as having come from, you know, purely from the objective world, then uh, they're always going to be subject to some sort of feedback mechanism that effectively is going to debase the values. Uh, you, you effectively get gamed by the system. So, you know, having some clarity as to the distinction between inward and outward is, is important. And then having some sort of uh, clarity as to things which are conditionalized uh, in, a, in a causal sense and things which are non-conditionalized, i.e. the basis of our choices, uh, does actually become important. Let's probe on that. I think I just came up with an interesting idea that will maybe will illuminate this for me and hopefully for the audience. I mentioned farming, something I'm involved with. I'm a farmer. My wife and I support local agriculture businesses, etc. as well. And farming is sort of complicated. It has some complex elements, but it's mostly complicated. But yet it's embedded in the ecosystem. And we make decisions as a civilization on way bigger scale than me on what kind of farming that we do. And that has huge implications through its coupling from the complicated to the complex. And it would at least be my argument that industrial farming is doing such damage to the outer complex ecosystem that it's not sustainable at all, even at the current level, let alone at the level which it has to be to provide a uh, Western level of standard of living for 8 billion people. So how would your analysis try to think about what that should mean for how we do agriculture? Well, first of all, I just want to you know state for the record that I'm in complete agreement with your point of view that we really, really do need to move to a sustainable way of doing things or else, you know, that which does not sustain life will not continue to live. So, you know, how do we apply, uh, you know, ethics in this particular case? Well, it's, it's not just about the ethics. It's also about, you know, what are our values and our values in this particular sense say, well, we want to be uh, sustainable. We want to be adaptive, right? So, for instance, not just sustainable, because if we if we just implement sustainable, it's a bit like, you know, how do we keep a complicated system going, no matter what happens in the complex world? I.e., we build some sort of thing that quote unquote lasts forever. But as as we've already mentioned, given that the complex is the basis for the complicated, that that, that ultimately that doesn't work. So, we need the capacity for the uh, complex systems to both be sustainable and to be adaptive, i.e. to evolve, to uh, basically work well with the context in which they exist. So for instance, as the natural world changes, we want to adapt our farming practices so that they continue to be sustainable over the long term. And in order to do that, we have to bring in this third element, which is, uh, in the, you know, I, I know you're probably going to hate that I'm going to use this word, but, but there's a certain consciousness involved, i.e. that uh, we're not just evolving in a blind sense the same way that, say, evolution would do. Because uh, although uh, evolution, uh, you know, if we think about the scientific method, for example, which is, you know, to perform experiments and to, you know, kind of dispassionately re review the results um, and then, you know, based upon the results to perform new experiments, uh, that nature implementing the uh, evolutionary model is effectively the perfect scientist. It tries everything and it is completely dispassionate absolutely about the results. So in effect, what happens is, is that, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, some of those experiments obviously fail. You know, we could end up with entire species dying off. We could entire, you know, continents basically becoming deserts. So in effect, we're, we're wanting to say, okay, if we're going to actually do thriving, if we're going to want to uh, move it beyond just what can be done through a pure feedback-based methodology, uh, we're going to have to have a kind of consciousness that transcends just evolutionary process. Uh, and we've sort of forced ourselves as a, as a species into this particular position uh, because of our use of technology. Technology has essentially enabled uh, a very strong top-down sort of way of thinking. And currently, it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, we're driving the top-down method as if it was uh, based upon the kind of unconsciousness of the, of the market system, the unconsciousness of evolutionary process. Uh, and we expect that that actually is going to, to, to have a good outcome. It's effectively a kind of unconsciousness. The market, uh, 
uh, evolution is unconscious in a fundamental way. And so as a result, we end up with the worst of both possible worlds, you know, pure evolution working by itself or pure technology working by itself. So in effect, what we're needing to do is we're needing to introduce a kind of uh, values based, meaningfulness based uh, way of thinking about these things, which effectively means that uh, we need to be clear about uh, what is our basis of choice? How are we thinking about choice in a way that is holistic, that's going to account for both evolutionary aspects and sustainability aspects? And how do we reconcile the relationship between uh, sustainability and evolution in a conscious way, which i.e. is uh, you know, connected to the notions of our values of thriving, the values of life, uh, the values of why we even thought that um, uh, adaptability and sustainability were important in the first place? Yep, absolutely well said. And by no means do I disagree with you. I mean, the evolutionary approach worked great for billions of years in biology and kind of the more loosely coupled social evolution in humans until we passed a certain threshold about 250 years ago, which was when we learned how to harvest fossil fuels. Then the game changed entirely. The scope of what humans could do started to go up exponentially. You couple that with the scientific method, with the ability to build information systems, to manage large-scale uh, entities, and human capability started to dwarf the resilience of the human space. You know, prior to 1750, there was really nothing humans could do to seriously damage the ecosystem. Now we can utterly destroy the ecosystem, or at least so badly that nothing more complicated than a cockroach will survive. So obviously, once we've reached this level of power, as you said, we have the power of gods, we need to have the wisdom of gods, and hopefully not like the Greco-Roman gods who were pretty damn capricious, right? Uh, you know, remember the Iliad, all the wacky shit the gods did there, right? We got to be better gods than those, and, and we have to, you know, think through, we, we now are in charge, you know, and we so damn well have the responsibility to figure out how we can use this unbelievable power we have responsibly to not wreck the ecosystem. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds right to me. I mean, I think that, again, you know, in proportion to the degree that there is an asymmetry of power, um, that we need a symmetry of strength. And so in effect, there's or a continuity of strength actually might be an even better way to state this is that, um, you know, our wisdom, our, our capacity to uh, really, you know, feel through and think through these these kinds of issues and to do both really, really well. You know, again, to make good choices in this space isn't just going to be dependent upon intellect. It's also going to be dependent upon a kind of quality of feeling through the issues. And, and I don't see those as, as any sense in, in opposition to one another. This, this goes back to uh, part of the reason why it was so important to distinguish between uh, values, meaning and purpose in the first place is that when we think about values, we can have all values. Values are not uh, defined in any kind of mutually exclusive way. Whereas when we talk about purposes, purposes are mutually exclusive. You know, you can basically do one thing at a time. And so in a, in a sense, there's a, there's a real need for us to, to have a good holding of both the, the ways in which we um, move from values into purpose, which is essentially is gated by this notion of meaningfulness. In other words, that there's a kind of flow that, that a multiplicity of values, that having a lot of values uh, allows us to identify something which is really meaningful. And that when we have a clear sense of, of of many things that are meaningful, then we can begin to start to think about, you know, a single purpose. And so, in, in effect, there's a there's there's a kind of um, you know progression here that is that is that is really important for us to 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 implement because if we don't, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the 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 sort of emotionality of you know the early depictions of uh, Greek gods as as an example and the and the kind of pseudo family dynamic that they had as a as an exemplar. Uh, was not wisdom in, in the sense that we would need. In fact, if you look at most of the religious uh, idealizations of, of deity forms, they actually have what would be, uh, if I were to apply the DSM-5, uh, tremendous pathologies, narcissism, magical thinking, all, all sorts of stuff which uh, effectively would, would, would show up on the dark triad of, of personality disorders. And so, um, in effect, what you end up with is, is a sort of need to have a much, much deeper, much, much more uh, coherent notion of what it means to make good choices that is based upon something that is that is even deeper than just, um, you know, I want in, in, in some unique sense, but in, in the sense of we want in some sort of collective sense. And to have that be, uh, you know, genuinely, um, to have a genuine capacity for that. Uh, so this, this is where we get from, you know, the notions of these things as thought about in an individual sense, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, thinking in terms of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, which is a very individual perspective, 
to how do we collectively, you know, make choices about things like uh, industrialized farming or, um, you know, resource usage and whether or not it makes sense to allocate resources in this direction or in that direction, uh, whether or not finance is defined purely in terms of market forces has actually got the level of intelligence necessary to deal with the kinds of X risk, uh, you know, side effects that are currently occurring. Um, so in effect, you know, there's a, there's a need for us to come down to a much, much deeper level of principle to handle the scope of the questions that we as a species are now currently faced with. Yeah, we have some giant challenges to go from where we are, where most people are blind to these things, to, to where we need to be. I mean, first, we need some form of sense making, right, that people even figure out what's going on realistically. And then we need to you know, make some choices and then we need to execute some actions. You know, what are your thoughts on you know, how do we move from where we are today, a complete muddle, blind, deaf and dumb to sense making, choice making and action taking? Well, that's that's actually the right question. And so, you know, one of the things that I heard uh, when I was you know, first learning how to be a CEO and so on is when you don't know what to do, look, see and tell the truth. So in other words, the, the first piece is, is that we need to actually enter into a kind of observational state and then to, you know, very dispassionately. I mean, because, again, you know, if we're, if we're looking to, to try to respond effectively, uh, there's a certain uh, degree of we're not going to filter the information. Like if you look at the way uh, emergency responders uh, you know, first responders show up at a situation, they're just saying, I see X, and they just broadcast that to the other people that are in the group. And, and everybody, in a sense, is sharing information in a pretty much uh, unfiltered way. They're really trying to uh, create a uh, ecosystem of, of, of just resources, informational resources. And, and from that, to basically begin to have some sense as to what's going on. And, and so, in effect, what we're, what we're looking at is, you know, can we create the right kind of information ecology? Well, um, as you may notice, uh, you know, on the internet, for example, we've actually done the exact opposite thing, that the market forces have uh, created huge incentives for uh, disinformation ecologies. And so in effect, you know, one of the first things that, that is important is for us to recognize that uh, we're not sharing information from any sort of personal benefit perspective. Um, does this uh, help my cause? Does this help me as an individual? Uh, will this enable me to get laid with this particular chick, you know, to, to some sort of, you know, community process of I'm sharing this information because collectively we live or die on the basis of how well this works. And so in a, in a sense, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a deep need for us to, to first, you know, perceive the world as accurately as we can share that information as transparently as we can. So in other words, uh, no filtering, and then to, to very much have a sort of real inquiry happen as, as, as kind of the, the beginning of the sense-making process. Are we asking the right questions? Uh, what questions do we need to ask in order to answer the important questions? What are the important questions? And so in effect, there's a, you know, before we even get to the point of doing choice-making, we're, we're asking questions about what is the state of the world? What is, what is actually our current position? And then we're asking questions as to, you know, what is our compass? Um, in, in order to really guide choices in, in an effective way, it's almost as if we need a, um, you know, three things. We need a, we need a map, we need a compass, and we need our current position. Um, if you if you subtract any one of those things, you know, I would say, well, uh, I can lose uh, an awareness of the map. I still need to know where I am, you know, in, in a real sense in the world, so that I can tell uh, if there's a cliff in front of me. Um, but if I if I absolutely uh, had to have just one thing, I would say have the compass. Obviously, these things by themselves don't really do as much. But if I have the compass and the compass is saying, hey, you know, you want to go in this direction, you know, I'm, I'm looking for true north. I'm looking for, you know, what are the uh, criteria of success in the design sense? What are the things that essentially is going to create a true, holistic, comprehensive solution to a problem such as uh, restoring the Amazon or, 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 or creating health and coral reefs or making sure that every man, woman and child is fed or making sure that the world has uh, you know, a future in the sense of, of, of not uh, destroying itself through some sort of uh, ecological accident that in effect, what we're wanting to do is, is, is to say, okay, given our compass and the knowledge of our current position, if we go in this particular direction, are we going to run into a cliff? Are we going to go off a cliff? Uh, are we going to go straight into the brambles? And then by looking at the map, we can start to think about where are we going and how do we get there that makes sense relative to where we are now? And so in, in a lot of ways, you know, sense making in this particular uh, capacity is, you know, again, what we're trying to do is to show what is necessary and sufficient 
to make good choices in the areas of existential risk, in the areas of civilization collapse, in the areas of what does it mean to, as a community, to solve the kinds of problems which are critically necessary for us to solve, to continue as a species, to continue as an ecosystem, given that, uh, you know, with all of these uh, highly asymmetric powers developed by technology that, 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 that we now find ourselves in, the, in both the possession of and the responsibility of uh, making good choices in this particular space. So, you know, in, in that particular sense, we're looking at a, a relatively nuanced approach. You know, if I, if I basically say, you know, uh, like I look at neurology, for example, and, and, you know, I take a look at an individual neuron, and let's say that we were to treat that neuron the same way that, um, you know, we currently treat, um, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as values, and that means that uh, every uh, impulse signal that that neuron is receiving on its dendrites is going to be uh, run through some sort of filtering process as to whether that neuron thinks it's going to be to its own interest to broadcast that signal onto its, uh, its axion, uh, you know, to send it downstream to other neurons. If it was uh, defined in that particular way that, um, you know, people were operating on their, uh, the neurons were operating on their own individual uh, personal benefit, then the, then the level of uh, disinformation in the uh, overall sphere of action ends up being so low, so poor that um, you, you don't end up with with either computation or consciousness. Um, so, so in effect, there's a there's a real need here for us to recognize that communication is not for our own sake. I mean, you know, there's a there's an evolutionary capacity that has been uh, created in in the human species. You know, we have we have language, but you know, from my perspective, we don't know how to communicate. Which is, which is a real irony in a, in, a, in a very profound way because, you know, in a sense, we've, we've taken this uh, adaptive capacity, which uh, may originally have been for things like assessing the health of a, of a potential mate uh, to, to, to think about long-term uh, family raising and, and to create culture in the child so that uh, the tribe could survive. Um, that, that, that then all of a sudden, you know, once we ended up with city-state uh, kind of capacities and then the enlightenment and so on, um, that, that we took the perspective that communication is really something that is for individual benefit. And unfortunately, we've reached a, a kind of crisis where uh, we're recognizing that that is no longer the case. That is no longer true. We can't, we can't operate uh, just from the perspective that communication, uh, that what we say and do with one another is purely for our own individual benefit, that we have to go beyond market process and start looking at um, non-rivalrous dynamics that, that effectively have uh, the capacity to uh, create the kind of conditions for good sense making to occur, because obviously the failure to do this was uh, essentially the end of the world. So, um, in, in this particular sense, you know, these are these are the kinds of things which 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 really come to mind immediately as being uh, absolutely germane and relevant to, um, you know, how do we do good sense making as a prelude to doing co- good choice making uh, itself as a prelude to say non corruptible, non capturable implementation process. Any thoughts? I mean, it looks like a shit show from where I sit out in the world. You know, if anything, our social sense making has gotten worse by the introduction of the Internet. Well, it has. And, and, and this is this is part of the thing is, is that, you know, when people introduce technologies like the Internet and so on and so forth, they have, you know, a sense of the potential of it. And, and you know, for every way in which something is good, there are two ways in which it could be bad. And even ironically, for every way in which something is bad, there are two ways in which it is, it is to be good. And so I think that you know, as technologists, uh, you know, we have, and, and again, you know, I'm speaking as someone who has, uh, you know, industrial capacity, you know, I've started a company, I've got resources and tools, um, you know, I can build stuff. And also as a, as a long-term software engineer, I've got uh, work uh, deployed at the Pentagon, I've got work deployed at, at various three-letter agencies and such. And so, you know, in effect, there's a, uh, there's a real deep sense as to our capacity as engineers, but as engineers, we need to go beyond the, the stereotype of the, you know, sort of Asperger's uh, perspective of the world and, and, and really get adept at thinking about the sociological aspects, uh, the anthropological and psychological aspects. And so in effect, when we're, when we're looking at the Internet, for example, we need to, again, from a principled basis, um, not necessarily from a market perspective, but from a principled basis to say, you know, we really need to change the orientation of, of how this, this, this actually works, how we're actually using social media technology, how we're actually uh, thinking about it. Social media technology, as it currently stands, uh, is, is very much deployed purely in service to corporate interests, uh, to the, the shareholder benefit, and, you know, is, is basically neglectful of community benefit, of, of user benefit. Um, so one of the things that has been of real interest to me is the work of the Center for Humane Technology, 
which has really been promoting a, uh, a re-understanding of social technology as basically being in service to community uh, as its primary objective, uh, rather than being of service to some sort of uh, surveillance capitalism or attention economy. Um, and I think that without you know, really making some good uh, inroads to recognizing uh, broadcasters as broadcasters, uh, moving um, you know, some, some you know, policy and legal phenomena into place, which, which has to do with the ethics of that, uh, you know, creating moral codes that effectively say, you know, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be responsible in, in your relationship to the community and that that is effectively a service and a devotion that is uh, fundamental to the institution rather than, um, you know, maximizing shareholder value on a quarterly scale. Because uh, obviously, if we're trying to think about sense making over uh, evolutionary timescales, um, you know, again, in terms of uh, farming practices and adapting to nature and so on, because, you know, that is the reality in which we live. Um, then, then in effect, we're going to need to be thinking on a much, much longer interval than, say, uh, market ecologies can actually do because they are uh, too much and, and compulsively driven on a short term perspective. The multipolar trap, uh, rules for rulers dynamic and all that kind of stuff very much, you know, essentially means that we, we really need to go to a completely much, much more comprehensive way of thinking about these things. And it starts from, you know, again, an individual perspective of you know, while I can operate on my own benefit some of the time, I can't operate on my own benefit all of the time, um, which is sort of the supposition that most people have in regards to, you know, what they say and do. And, and, and moreover than that, you know, collectively, we need to get much, much better at, at holding uh, responsibility in association with authority. So, you know, when, when a technology company has the authority to define a platform, you know, we say, hey, either be responsible for that platform, you know, I actually... Um, do the things that are that are necessary to preserve the well-being of the community on that platform. And so, you know, I can point to things like uh, Facebook and say, you know, you do actually need to be responsible for the impact of, you know, whether or not uh, you have politicians uh, basically spreading misinformation and disabling the, the information ecology. Um, and, you know, to some extent, we can really ask the question of, is it even the case that a representative model of governance uh, is actually the right one? Do we need some sort of sense making that is effectively uh, broader than that? You know, some sort of direct democracy process. But but in you know again in a larger context, we're realizing that you know at an individual level, we we definitely need to move beyond the notion that communication is purely for our own individual life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to our con- collective life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because those two things are not uh, separate from one another. They are deeply entangled, and that. Um, in effect, we, uh, at this particular point, have uh, a very naive understanding of the nature of choice and value and ethics and all this kind of stuff. So getting educated, getting clear as to, uh, you know, what really matters, uh, talking to one another about how these things actually work, uh, I think is absolutely essential. Yep, I agree with you about Center for Humane Technology. I'm a great fan of their work. In fact, Tristan Harris is going to be on the show next month, and we're going to dig into this quite a bit. It is interesting. I've been involved in building what we would now call the Internet since 1980. I built some of the earliest things that we would now call social media. And at the time, we had no idea of the uh, potential negative implications. So we thought we were doing not only uh, – good business, but we're doing something great for the, you know, the civic soul of humanity. And we figured, how could it be any better than having access to all this information, let anybody's voice be heard, et cetera? How naive we turned out to be. And what's interesting is, you know, I think you know, we all know Facebook's a shit show, Twitter's worse. But here's something that's kind of interesting. There's many of us now who know this, but nobody that I know of has built a decent sense-making platform for the 100,000 or million woke people, awake people. I don't want to use the word woke and get me confused with those idiots, but awake people about these issues for us to start to rally together. I wonder why that is. Well, I don't necessarily know why that is. I'm not going to speculate about that. I mean, you mentioned naivete earlier, and, and to some extent, there's a, a need for us to have, you know, again, both technological experience, but also sociological and anthropological experience. And in addition to that, uh, a deep sense of understanding of ethics and metaphysics under it. And so in a, in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, well, OK, it, we, we, we have as a species been largely unconscious, but you you do actually point to essentially the real thing here rather than. Uh, trying to diagnose why hasn't this happened. You know, I can definitely do some uh, extensive diagnosis as to, you know, what got us here won't get us there. What is uh, really the ultimate uh, basis of the the nature of the problems that have come into the world and so on and so forth. But the the point of such analysis isn't so much uh, 
uh, to lay blame so much as it is to provide litmus tests for the success of a solution that we might propose. So in other words, you know, if we were to uh, think about, okay, well, how are we going to create a platform that effectively is going to be uh, the basis of good sense making, a good choice making at a species level? Um, you know, what are the characteristics that it's going to look like? Well, ultimately, uh, immediately, we already start asking questions. And, and the questions as part of the sense making we're doing with respect to the platform itself, as well as the thing that the platform actually does. Um, and one of the questions effectively just immediately becomes, it's not a platform. You know, why, why should we have a platform rather than a protocol? Because uh, if I if I create it as a platform, then effectively I've already created the kind of dynamics of capturability and the and the sort of market forces themselves, uh, centralization that uh, is already identified as as having been uh, somewhat disabling to the kind of choice making processes we need to do, uh, which to some extent really need to be distributed. You know, there's kind of a recognition that ultimately there's just so much information that needs to be processed in order to make a good choice. That is just simply not the case that any amount of centralization is effectively going to be able to handle the bandwidth that is required. For example, you know, if I if I look at institutional design and it's based upon some sort of top down model, then just from information theoretic constraints, I know that there are certain problems that it can't solve. Um, things that, for example, are so complex, so complicated that no single human being in their entire lifetime could learn all that they would need to do to make good choices in that space. You know, that even if we were to have, you know, that person surrounded by a team of advisors or we were to have a team of, of say, 12 people that were trying to make choices with respect to 100,000 people, uh, it can immediately be observed. Is there any possible way that a person can have the wisdom of 100,000 or that a person can have the wisdom of the billion of people that their choices actually influence? Well, even if we look at you know, small subgroups, we can ask the same question. Can any possible organization of 12 people with any amount of system structure support and so on have the wisdom of a billion people? Well, probably not just because, you know, again, just just sheer logarithm understandings of, of, of the, the dynamics of the information flows. We simply say, OK, well, we can get maybe a square root level of, of uh, you know, reduction in the number of nodes needing to process this amount of information, but we really shouldn't try for better than that because otherwise we start losing the critical information necessary to make good choices. So even though we know that from a market sense that uh, distributed systems are less efficient in the sense of uh, energy usage and sense of time and sense of responsiveness, you know, that they are uh, ultimately necessary in order to do the work that needs to be done because we're actually looking at not an efficiency basis, but a quality basis. Is the quality of the choices being made by the, not the platform, but now the protocol, does the underlying protocol have the characteristics necessary such that the quality of the choices is sufficiently good to be responsive to things like existential risk? So in effect, what we're really looking at here is, is not uh, relative thresholds, but, but, but absolute ones. It not only has to be better than our current solutions, it has to be good enough to actually be satisficing uh, relative to an absolute metric and that in effect this sets hard limits on uh, what the level of minimum quality of the outcome of the choices being made uh, and their implementation actually are which itself sets uh, limitations on uh, what is the minimum quality of sense making which itself sets questions on you know what is the minimum quality of the questions being asked so you know we're, we're really looking at are we asking the right questions? Do we have a way to know and, 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 and to very much develop a process in that particular area? Uh, so in recognition of all of that, I, I've been uh, what, what I've been doing to respond to all of this. I mean, you know, I spent uh, the early part of my life developing the metaphysics to have the tool set. Um, and now I'm, I'm basically anticipating spending much of the rest of my life basically putting together, uh, you know, things like ephemeral group process, which are uh, ways to. Uh, enable a much, much higher level of, of quality of, of um, you know, question asking uh, so that we at least have a chance at doing the kind of sense making necessary to respond to the kinds of issues that humanity is faced with. You know, my hopes and dreams at this particular point, you know, again, speaking back to, you know, why was I ultimately doing this, you know, loving nature, loving the wild, um, you know, basically being thankful for the gift of life um, that, that in effect, I'm, I'm basically saying, well, it seems like as best as I can tell, that the most effective use of my time is to put it into uh, developing, uh, you know, these capacities to do sense making at civilization level scales. Um, so in effect, at this point, you know, I'm trying to, um, you know, gather like minded people to to essentially uh, assist in transcription, to assist in editing, to assist in uh, 
um, you know, basically providing the time and resources necessary to uh, develop protocols of this kind that could potentially uh, be tested to see whether or not they achieve the level of quality necessary and to continue to develop in that direction. And so, you know, as a result of, of all that, that's kind of why I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to, uh, you know, really give voice to some of these notions. Now, recently, there's been some very harsh critique on the notion of sense making out in the so-called Game B world. You're familiar with Game B, I believe. You've been uh, associated with some of the other Game B players. Interestingly, I did a Google, and your name and Game B do not appear anywhere on the internet, which is kind of interesting. Well, I think the word Design B rather than Game B. I think if we think about it in terms of games, there's winners and losers, and we really need it to be a you know win-win solution or win-win-win solution. In other words, if we really want to be technically correct, but I haven't really been that active on the internet. I have, I mean, I've been around for a while, so you will find my, uh, my name connected to a handful of things, mostly just incidental stuff, but I haven't really taken very much of a public perspective. I've mostly just, you know, put my head down and try to do the work that needs to be done. That's a good thing. Maybe let me get it back to this critique about sense making, because there's been a lot of talk about sense making and some attempts at it. But one of the critiques, which you know does resonate with me to a degree, is that from where we stand today, where we're heading towards these existential risks at an accelerating rate, sense making by itself isn't even close to enough, right? Because even if we knew what the right things to do are, and truthfully, probably uh, you and me and three people that we know could sit around a table and come up with a better trajectory than we're on today by a shitload. Where is the mechanism to use the levers that can move the trajectory of society? So sense-making alone is just a waste of time, frankly, and basically a wanking exercise, unless there's the ability to actually change the trajectory of our society. What do you say to that? Well, actually, I agree. I never claimed that sense-making by itself would be enough. I mean, without uh, sense making, choice making isn't enabled, but choice making by itself isn't enough either. So, you know, let's say uh, you and I got together and we we spent a bunch of time, figured out the answer, made some clear choices, but then didn't have the capacity to implement those choices, didn't have a capacity to bring them, you know, into the world uh, as manifest results. Then, uh, to some extent, those choices aren't choices. You know, there's this thing called the principle of identity: uh, that which is indistinguishable must be the same. Uh, so, in effect, if I can't distinguish between having made a choice and not having made a choice, uh, i.e. there are no consequences, um, then, then in effect, you know, there's, there's no real sense of choice making. So, you know, I definitely agree that, that, that bringing things into manifestation, having the capacity to actually implement uh, is, is, is a crucial thing. But, but I think that to some extent what we're looking at here is, is, is not an either or question. So, you know, again, sense making by itself is not enough. Choice making by itself is not enough. Uh, implementation by itself is not enough because even if we had the capacity to implement whatever it is that we chose, the implementation capacity without any kind of guidance is uh, obviously uh, also worthless. So in effect, there's a there's a sense here of what's necessary and what's sufficient. So if we had sense making and choice making and implementation capacity, then maybe we have a chance. Is that sufficient? It might be. At, at this particular point, I think that you know, if, if, if we hit the, the quality of implementation uh, that is needed, if we hit the quality of choice making that is needed, if we hit the quality of sense making that is needed, then, then you know, is that those things being necessary, is that sufficient to, to actually uh, move ourselves out of crisis and into, uh, you know, some sort of comprehensive responsiveness? Well, I, I think that it is. I mean, at, at this particular point, you know, I, I'm working on a hard proof of that, but the, the, the ultimate result here is, is that we do know that those things are necessary because if we if we just look at uh, implementation capacity by itself, I mean, well, we actually have that already. Institutions, you know, federal government and, and you know, a lot of businesses and so on and so forth already have uh, all the resources necessary to, to, to implement enormous change. I mean, obviously, uh, changes have actually happened. Technology has been deployed. Uh, social media platforms do exist and so on, do railroads and so on. And in effect, what we're, what we're looking here is saying, OK, well, given that you know, as individuals, we can do great sense making, but as individuals, we have terrible implementation capacity. And given that as institutions, we have tremendous implementation capacity, but terrible sense making capacity, that to some extent, we need to upgrade the sense making capacity because without that, we can't have the institutions make choices that actually matter. So, you know, is the structural design of the institutions as we currently conceive them uh, able to essentially have all three at once, the sense making, making, 
uh, information gathering capacity, uh, the, the, you know, the quality of choices that are comprehensive enough, responsive enough to um, complex, not just complicated uh, design questions. And then finally, can we have those implementations occur in a way that is non-corruptible, that actually represents the choices uh, that are made rather than, say, uh, being co-opted by some third party for private benefit? Um, and so, you know, when we look at, you know, implementation systems as they exist currently, we, we notice that corruption is an issue. And, you know, again, there's lots of governments in the world where effectively uh, due to the necessary internal dynamics of, of those you know, institutions that, you know, to some extent to just even ensure their own survival, that they uh, end up having to make very, very poor choices with respect to the well-being of the community. And so in, in a lot of ways, we're looking at, you know, if we just focus on implementation criteria and basically look at it from that, that point of view alone, then, then we discover that we already need to do sense making and choice making about institutional design so that we can ensure that the, the way in which those institutions manifest uh, the things that they do in the world don't end up doing more harm than good. Um, if if you look at, you know, game theory, game A, uh, particularly, it's 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 very much the case that people want to create markets. Uh, particularly if you manage to create a new market and you create a platform on which that market happens, then um, you get to essentially do a kind of Metcalfe's law growth process, and also at the same time to be extracting value from that market, uh, charging taxes in one way or another. Um, you know, charging rent or, or, you know, taking a percentage of profits or something like that, um, that, you know, the upside for you as a market developer is enormous because, you know, when you're not just doing, you know, additive uh, increase in wealth by the results of your own efforts or a multiplicative uh, increase in wealth, to say, the way you would as a banker, but um, that now all of a sudden you're doing exponential increase in wealth because you're effectively uh, creating a tap on an entire ecosystem, that in effect, the, the problem is, is that that process is parasitic. And, you know, as, as you increase the number of parasites in a system, eventually the wildebeest dies. So, you know, in, in a lot of ways, what we're, what we're looking at here is, you know, we actually need good quality process for all three. And that if we don't hit sufficient quality thresholds for all three, that, that uh, for sure this isn't going to be enough. Um, so, yeah, I actually agree with the critique that sense making isn't enough. But on the other hand, if we don't at least apply good sense making with respect to institutional design, then, you know, whatever it is that we're doing will probably end up being captured by some hidden party and, and used to their uh, private benefit and just end up as a side effect externalizing uh, considerable harm uh, to the well-being of the commons, to the well-being of the community. And so, you know, personally, uh, you know, when you when you think about uh, do I have any real belief that the taxes that I pay are actually going to go to my well-being? Uh, and if my uh, answer to that question is no, then, then you know, my overall uh, faith in the system is, is is low enough that I'm not interested in increasing their capacities in the implementation sense. I'm interested in increasing their capacities at the choice making and sense making levels. And and though unfortunately the gap is that the sense making and choice making needs to be needs to essentially wrestle control of the implementation from a self-serving status quo. That's the real challenge, right? In many countries, it's just pure corruption. Yeah. And in many countries, in our country, it's not quite pure corruption, but it's soft corruption of the political process by the vested interests. Yeah, I, I agree. There are some real serious challenges here. I mean, this is, uh, in some respects, you know, speaking as an engineer, seriously, the, the single most difficult problem I could even attempt to imagine, you know, there's 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 clearly some some real challenges here. And, you know, I you, you mentioned that one specifically, but uh, there are hosts of others which are which are uh, also quite gnarly. And, you know, again, this is the kind of thing where, you know, quite frankly, I would love to have some some qualified help, you know, but in, in, this, in this particular sense, you know, I agree. These are these are real issues and these are real challenges. Obviously, if, you know, if someone were to come up with some way of, of addressing these kinds of things, even then they'd have to be very careful about it because, you know, trying to suggest, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to wrestle control away. I mean, well, first of all, it's not even a question about control. It's actually a question of influence. Does any neuron have control over what the whole brain does? Does, does the brain even have control over itself? I know that, you know, in terms of just my own subjective self, I, I can try to you know, control my state of feeling. I can try to control my behavior and so on and so forth. But at best, I'm going to only do is is learn good skills and, and to become increasingly adaptive, increasingly healthy. Um, that's probably not going to be some sort of, uh, you know, overthrow or, or some sort of coup. It's going to be something more like, um, you know, a gradual adoption of, uh, 
of uh, better practices. And, and, you know, let's hope that that happens sufficiently well and sufficiently fast enough. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, that's all well and good. You know, we'll gradually make the beasts smarter. But do we have time? It all depends on do we fall into a positive feedback loop around climate? Is there a pandemic? There's, you know, lots of ways we could we could run out of time. And I think that's a really interesting question. Is the attempt to influence a sufficient tactical strategy or, or does there need to be uh, something more decisive? I think as far as, and, and that question is a very good question. And it's like, you know, do we have enough time? Well, that's an unknowable thing. I, don't, I have no idea, right? I mean, we can say, hey, these are issues of the feedbacks that are going on in these particular areas are crucial issues. There's an increasing number of crucial issues that are near term that need address. Um, you know, as it becomes more and more obvious to people that, hey, we're actually out of time. We really need to be better at these kinds of things. The problem with the reset process is, is that, you know, you might hit reset, but you're not necessarily going to end up with a better state. You, you, you may have slowed things down a little bit, but you still haven't developed the capacity to prevent it from happening all over again. So, for instance, you know, civilizations have come and go. If you look at the historical record that we have, you know, it's like, you know, a few hundred civilizations that have lasted a few hundred years, uh, some longer, maybe a thousand years or so. But very few of them. Uh, in fact, none of them. Our civilization right now is 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 essentially, you know, just on, on, on one of the longer sides. But but there's no guarantee that our civilization is going to endure any longer than any of the other examples that have come and gone. And so, you know, in effect, what we're really concerned with here is can we uh, upgrade the capacity in some fundamental way? Because uh, regardless of how much time we have, you know, we, we still haven't changed anything. So say we do the reset and we come out on the other side of that. But all of the institutions that we make at that point, uh, all of the new civilization practices that we put in place, you know, coupled with the technology that has been discovered or rediscovered from our civilization, you know, end up creating those same existential risks, those same civilization collapse dynamics, the same fucked up market economies, um, you know, conflated interests and, 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 you know, perverse incentives and all the rest of that stuff, that in effect, we're just going to end up in this boom and bust cycle. The problem is, is that given the level of technological development that we have, um, we're now entangling the entire ecosystem. So reset at this particular point means, you know, reset for maybe, you know, a billion years. Or maybe never. I mean, it, it might be that, that we've damaged the ecology so much that the human species just doesn't endure. And so, in effect, there's a uh, there's there's a real question here of we can't do the boom and bust cycles given the uh, asymmetric power of the technology. So we have to actually develop new capacities in sense making and choice making and implementation. Uh, then we have, um, even if we were looking at um, you know running out of time, we would still need to do this. And so, in effect, we're looking at it in the sense of, okay, well, it needs to be done either way, regardless of the amount of time. I can't control or even know how much time I have, but I do know that doing it while the current civilization context is in place, that I can, I can effectively uh, do better design, do better uh, engineering and, and, and social process uh, in the context of our, our, our existing civilization, um, you know, to create design for for new uh, capacities to respond to these kinds of issues using the context that we have. So in that sense, I would say, you know, reset's not a good thing because, you know, coming out of a reset, we're not going to have the kind of capacities to even think about these issues because we're basically living hand to mouth in the stone age again. So in effect, what we're uh, therefore saying is, well, I can't control the, the time period. I can't control the necessity. Um, the only thing I can do is use the resources that we have today as best as we possibly can to respond to this thing as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so as a result, I end up basically asking for support. You know, can people provide, you know, good uh, capacities to try to speed up uh, our capacity to good do good sense, make good choice, make good institutional design in this space, good community design, ultimately community design, because that's the, the, the crux of it all, is that, um, you know, in effect, we have a better chance of doing it now than we would at any other point, uh, given that we can integrate uh, things like uh, all of the knowledge we've collected in science and technology, sociology, anthropology, psychology, philosophy, metaphysics, and just the works. I mean, literally at this point, we have um, the maximum amount of information and resource that we would uh, ever uh, really have to be able to solve the problem. And we have the necessity to do it now because uh, we don't know how long we're going to have to work on this. So in effect, the, the, the only thing I can really do is to say uh, very much that uh, we really need to do 
uh, a lot of uh, development in this space, uh, pretty much stat, and to and to really have the process that is uh, creating this be uh, very much a non-commercial thing because we know that the commercial process is is, uh, is is messed up. So in effect, you know, we're asking for donations rather than investments. We're asking for uh, time commitments rather than just um, you know dollars because you know without having some uh, real good way to um, you know, develop this in, in a way that integrates the comprehensive field of knowledge that 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 has uh, been the outcome of Western civilization and and and, e- and Eastern philosophies and all that. Um, you know, what we have as the world essentially at this particular point is both the, the the need and at this point the best enablement we could ask for. That's good. We're uh, getting close to the end of our time here, and unfortunately, I have lots of things I wanted to talk to you about, particularly uh, some of my very favorite things from your thinking about small group practice, you know, your paper on the nature of human assembly. I went and read that carefully. I have a lot of questions, and we've talked before you and I offline about your ephemeral group process, both very interesting, but we don't have time for that. So my exit question is something I found during my research. You gave a TEDx talk called the Accident of Unconsciousness, where you talked about how exceedingly unlikely it is for us to exist, right? And that gets very close to a topic that we've talked about many times on this show, which is the Fermi Paradox. The Fermi Paradox is from Enrico Fermi during the Manhattan Project, where a bunch of young physicists were talking about, oh, there's got to be 100,000 intelligent species in the uh, galaxy, etc. And Fermi came by and said, okay, where are they? And that's been where we're at. We've now been searching fairly seriously for other advanced civilizations for 60 years and haven't found any. And uh, the reason I raise this, because you, you were actually close to it, and in fact, I think you were there, but you didn't make it explicit, is it strikes me that this is a hugely important, maybe the single biggest question about humanity and its role in the universe. If indeed we are alone, And we may be, you know, when I was a 13 year old nerdy kid, I would have said, oh, yeah, there's 100,000, just like the physicists, the young physicists at Los Alamos. Oh, yeah, certainly got to be other intelligent species in the universe. The more I've learned about, the more I've studied it, the more I've thought about it, the less sure I am. I'm now to the point where I'm entirely agnostic that maybe we are alone. And of course, there are other folks like Stuart Kaufman, who we had on the show not long ago. He believes that life always forms if, if the situation is even close to right. Maybe he's right. Maybe the uh, people that say it's an exceedingly rare event are right. But where I think you were going was until we know more, we probably it's probably safe for us to assume that we are unique. And if we are unique in having reached the level of general intelligence, one could say that we have a purpose as a species, which is to bring the universe to life. And if we destroy our life here, or at least destroy our ability to leave the earth and to move out into the universe, then we'll have squandered one of the, perhaps the actual purpose of our existence. I couldn't agree more. I think this is absolutely the right direction to be thinking about this. I, I definitely have spent a lot of time thinking about the Fermi paradox and its implications and uh, relevance, as, as you've definitely mentioned. In fact, that was part of the reason why I even put that section into the uh, the TEDx of uh, the accident of unconsciousness. And so, in effect, yes, I do. I do very much agree. And and there's a lot of there's a lot of good thinking in this space. So I'm, I'm thinking particularly of uh, Anders Sandberg and uh, some of his recent work in this, uh, which essentially uses uh, information theoretic methods to to really address that question. So I would definitely recommend taking a look at his work because he's addressing the question in a, in a kind of unique way. And, and, and it's based upon, you know, how do we how do we think about uh, questions like this using the tools of information theory and risk modeling and such like that? Another direction that I think is is particularly important, as, as you mentioned, is that, you know, let's assume, for example, that we are, you know, the unique species, the, the unique uh, life uh, in the universe. Um, I don't necessarily need to make that particular claim because. Um, even if there were life all over the universe in the sense of, you know, lots and lots of different manifestations, I could say that just from an information theor- theoretic perspective, uh, there's still a, a huge degree of unicity associated with this life. So there's a gift there. There's, a, there's an enormous miraculousness associated with that gift. And to, to really appreciate that and to understand that means that to some extent we actually have to get the ethics of that right. One of the uh, connections back to the Fermi paradox is that one of the ideas about, you know, why don't we see uh, other intelligent life in the universe is, is that they very prudently would be uh, aware of 
well, I don't want to contact another civilization. I want to ensure that I'm absolutely invisible because without an acknowledgement that there is essentially uh, a, a sufficiently developed level of ethical uh, thinking and behavior, if I don't see that the basis of choice that that particular species is, is, is implementing, um, that it's, it's, it's too dangerous to talk to them. Um, so in effect, think, think of it from like a first contact perspective, right? So given kind of the background, I'm, and I'm thinking a little bit of, of the way uh, Nick Bostrom uh, would think of this, is that, okay, so we have the possibility of initiating a first contact situation, but let's assume that both sides, you know, the contactee and the contactor, both have enormous existential technology. In other words, they have the capacity to to leverage uh, something like nuclear warheads and there's no defense. Like, like let's say that's, it's, that the technology is so asymmetric in its power that if, if one side were to initiate an attack on the other, that the, that the defending side couldn't possibly defend. And, and so, you know, we say, okay, well, to, to really make the point, you, you, you say, not only is it the case that there are hugely asymmetric technologies that, that either side could have against the other, but that there's essentially thousands of different kinds of technologies each of which is uh, asymmetric in this particular way. And so, you know, if contactor A and contactee B both have uh, any one of thousands of completely asymmetric technologies, which uh, from the perspective of the other one is both unknown, like, um, you know, we may have developed completely asymmetric capacity in nuclear technology, but they may have developed completely asymmetric uh, capacity in biological technology. And some other party may have developed a completely asymmetric capacity in compute technology. Um, now, those happen to be ones that we know about. But let's assume that some other species, some other race uh, out in space somewhere or another has developed three completely different technologies that we don't have names for and that uh, effectively are just as, as uh, you know, life destroying, as civilization destroying, as planet destroying as, as those three could be. And so in effect, we would basically say, well, since we have no idea, if, if I'm the contactor and I'm basically saying, hey, I want to talk to this other species, um, but I don't know that that other species, I don't know what technologies they developed, that just even the fact of letting them know that we exist is an existential risk to myself. That's called the dark forest theory on the Fermi paradox, where nobody's willing to speak up in the dark forest because we believe the forest is full of predators, or at least we're not sure. And that could indeed be the explanation. One of, it's one of a hundred possible explanations. And these are all important, and I, but I think the biggest part is what we talked about just as we introduced this, which is these are reasons why we need to be smart about preserving ourselves, because we might be the only one, in which case if we blow it, this is huge. And even if we're not the only one, to your point, we do bring a very high level of uniqueness to the universe, and over time we should be able to spar our perspective through the universe. And to, to blow that is to blow something huge, and that should be our, at least one of our motivations to think through these existential risks to find a way, find a way somehow to, to get the wisdom of good gods now that we seem to have the power of gods. So that's part of the reason why I mentioned the dark forest thing is because there's an, actually an additional reason. If we assume that, you know, there's this background that I've just sort of set up, the only context in which any species would ever actually talk to another one is if they knew that the ethics that was implemented by the opposing party was at least sufficient to be able to be safe to talk to them. So in effect, it's it's a bit like, you know, I, I mentioned the non-relativistic ethics as the second path or the second aspect of that TED Talk. And it's critically important because if we as a, as a, as a world have an ethics which is to that standard, to that level of thing, then it becomes at least possible that other species, other uh, worlds would want to talk to us and share resources and actually be in some sort of relationship. Without that level of development, at least at a minimum, then we're just basically too unsafe to talk to. And, and effectively, the predator nature uh, ends up being the dominant factor. And so, uh, in effect, we're, we're essentially saying, you know, if we want to find other intelligent life in the universe, we have to be a fit receptacle for that information. And so, in effect, it, it, it then becomes incumbent upon us, even in the sense of maybe we're not to seed the universe, but just to essentially be a participant, a citizen of the universe that we have to be a good citizen and a good citizen to some extent means that we need to do enough self work, not only to survive, but also to actually participate. An even better reason to get our shit straight. I agree. <laughs>
All right. On that note, thank you. This has been an amazing conversation. I wish we could go on for two and a half hours, and maybe we'll have you back on again to talk about some of these other topics which we didn't get to. So thank you, and this was great. Have a great day. I've been appreciating this, and uh, it's been a wonderful conversation as well, and I look forward to next time. Production services and audio editing by Jared Jaynes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.